Good morning, New Covenant Church, and even those of you who are probably not from our church but are still watching. It is so wonderful to have you here today on this live stream. Um, I hope you're having a wonderful Sunday morning. I hope that you're gathered around with your family. Feel free to give them nice big hugs. We know that we can't hug people outside of our homes, but we can hug our family. So reach out your arms, go give your family some hugs, and let's get started with worship. Come to church and thanks for joining our live stream. If this is your first time with us, we're honored that you're here. We'd love to get to know you more, so please make sure to send us a Facebook message so we can connect with you. Now, before we continue on with the rest of our service, here are a few announcements. Some of our connect groups are still meeting, not in person, 
but on either Zooms or on Facebook Live. So please make sure you reach out to the Connect group leaders and find out how you can get connected. And if you're not a part of the group, please message us so we can get you connected to the right group. Coronavirus has had a huge impact in our lives, whether it's work-related or health-related. So please make sure you're reaching out to your friends and family, making sure they're okay, and supporting them through this difficult time. And if you have a prayer request, we have a prayer request line that you can call, or you can drop us a message on Facebook. We believe that giving is an act of worship, just like our singing, praying, or serving. And if you feel led to give today, there are several ways you can do so. You can give digitally on our website or with the Tithely app, or if you prefer, you can mail your check-in to our P.O. box. Once again, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Now let us be strong and courageous, for it is the Lord our God who goes with us.
Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I really miss a lot of you folks. Um, I guess I should say I miss everybody. Um, but uh, we're looking forward to coming back together. I hope this is a familiar backdrop for you this morning. For those of you that uh, attend our church services on Sunday morning. Um, but before we get started this morning into the word, before we unpack the scriptures, let's have a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. I pray, Lord, that you would just have your hand upon uh, the reading of your word. Lord, I pray that you would uh, allow it to be uh, clear and present. I pray that you would uh, make it clear to the hearts and lives of those that are listening. We thank you, Lord, for this platform, the opportunity to spread the gospel. I pray that you would have your hand upon every heart and life that hears this message this morning. Uh, Lord, that you would do a work. I pray your Holy Spirit would touch and, and go and to the areas of the heart that cannot be gone by any man. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to rely solely on the, on the strength of the Word of God, Lord, and the gospel, for it is enough. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So for the last several weeks, we have been in the life of Elijah, and it's been a progressive journey as we've watched how God has brought Elijah onto the scene. And we looked three or four weeks ago uh, at how the Lord used Elijah and told him after there had been six months of no rain because Elijah had prayed. And the reason that all this was happening was because God's people, his children, were being disobedient. They were bringing in false idols and worship. They turned their back on God. And so God uses Elijah as his mouthpiece, as a prophet of the Lord, and he stands before Ahab. And he's before Ahab, and he tells Ahab, we're about to have three more years of no rain. And Ahab is absolutely furious. And so at that moment, God tells Elijah, now that I've brought you to the forefront and I've exposed you to the enemy, now I want you to go to the brook Cherith and I want you to hide there for three years. And so we find in the story, we talked about this several weeks ago, that God sends Elijah and he hides himself, and it was almost as if it was uh, a step backwards for Elijah, because when, when the Lord gives you a word, and then he places you in a wilderness, it can be a little confusing. In Matthew chapter 3, in verse 17, I believe it was, we see Jesus, and the scene there is John the Baptist is baptizing Jesus, and you hear the voice of the Lord say, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then the very next verse, chapter 4, verse 1, the Bible says, Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Spirit of the Lord. And just after he gets his word, he experiences his wilderness. And so Elijah gets his word, stand before, Eli uh, stand before Ahab and uh, expose yourself to the, to the evil king and the evil queen Jezebel. And now I want you to drop this bomb and I'm just going to tell them like it is. But now I want you to go and hide. And so we find that he goes there, God provides, he gives him food and water from the brook, and then he sends them, the, the brook dries up, we talked about that a couple weeks ago, the brook, brook dries up, and then he sends them to Zarephath, and it's there that he uh, steps into the life of a widow woman who has no money, and her and her son are about to eat their last meal and die, and God uses the, the two uh, families to, to collide, and God uses each one of them to provide for the other. And uh, God does an, a miraculous thing after the widow woman's son passes away and dies. And Elijah, the Bible says in James chapter 4 and 5, that he was a man just like us. He, was, he, he, had, secure, he had insecurities, he had uh, fears and, and hopes and dreams. His insecurities had insecurities. He had doubts, he questioned God. Uh, he was just like us. And one of the things that stood out about Elijah was that he was a man that was obedient to the voice of the Lord. And so we see a lot of these things that has taken place, and now we're at the very beginning of chapter 18. In chapter 18, we see that God is taking Elijah yet another step further in his walk of faith, in this journey that Elijah's on, just like he is doing so in your life and in mine. But before we go into 18, for just a moment, 
I want to just park for just a minute back at chapter 17. If you have your Bibles, chapter 17, verse 1, it should be on the screen. The Bible said, Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tish in Gilead said to Ahab, this is where he stands before him, and I want to bring out something for, for just a minute, and we're going, to, we're going to go somewhere with it. As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand. Now, the words before whom I stand is very important because you'll see it again in chapter 18. And also, next week, we'll look at chapter 19, verse 11. You see it said again. But he says, There shall neither be rain for three years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him. And God said, Depart from here and turn eastward beside the brook Cherith which is east of the Jordan. So if you'll remember a couple of weeks ago at the very beginning, we didn't spend a lot of time on it, but we talked about the brook Cherith and how the English terminology of Cherith is Cherith. But in the Hebrew, it's Kerith, which is a covenant word that we find in Genesis chapter 15. And God uses it when he's speaking to Abram and he cuts a covenant with Abram. And he says, I'm going to cut a covenant with you. I'm going to Kerith this covenant with you. And I'm going to be your God and you are going to be the father of many nations and you're going to be my people and I will bless them that bless thee. I will curse them that curse thee. And we see that in this time. But the word cherith literally means to cut. And so we find that very interesting because this place of hiding that God has Elijah wasn't just a place of limbo. Stuff was happening. God was moving in the life of Elijah for a particular reason. It was a place, this brook was a place of provision. God brought the ravens, he fed them uh, the bread from the raven's beak. He brought them water, he took care of them. But it was also a place of protection because it was there that was hiding from Ahab and Jezebel. But it was also a place of preparation. God was preparing Elijah for a purpose, just like he has for your life and for mine. He puts us in a place of hiding, a place by a brook, but that brook seems like a dry wilderness. Why? Because it's not what we are imagining is success. It's often in this moment of the Christian life uh, that many of us get derailed. When God has you going in a direction uh, that goes against the very nature of what makes sense. When God asks you to go to a place in your life that seems unreasonable, but it is in the very place that he will prepare you for opportunities to give him more glory. Elijah has been through the crap, for the lack of a better word, but has been this necessary crap because it is being used to fertilize Elijah's faith for what is to come in the next chapter of his life. It seems unreasonable to leave a great job to move to a foreign country. It would seem unreasonable to step back in a leadership role of any kind to learn how to follow with grace. It seems unreasonable to try to birth something new when there's no guarantee of success, only the calling of God by which to do it. It seems unreasonable to forgive those that have hurt you, but you no longer are driven by your flesh, you are driven by the Word of God. You can't have the mountain in your life until you're willing to submit to the brook. Elijah's about to step on the scene in chapter 18, and he's about to go to Mount Carmel. It's an amazing place. I was just there uh, several months ago, my wife and I, and uh, it was one of my favorite spots. And it was there that God uses Elijah to call down fire from heaven and stop the rain and show that he is the one true God, the creator of the universe. But that would have never taken place had Elijah not submitted in the brook. Our time spent by the brook will sometimes feel like a step backward. But God is using it to ready you for what's on the mountain. Before we moved back to Myrtle Beach, um, we had come to the place where our ministry, where we were, was over, and God had brought us here. And, uh, you know, we have these lofty ideas, these lofty plans, and say, okay, God, I, I want you to bless my plan. 
And so, you know, we were we knew that we were going to plant a church and and the Lord had, had got us to this place. This was our home. We grew up here. We met here. My wife and I went to school here, went to college here. We got married here. And so I'm coming back after 15 years. And I'm thinking I'm going to have this plan A, plan B, plan C, backup plan A, backup plan B, backup plan C. And God decides to just throw all that out the, the window and put me in a place where I was breading raw chicken at the Chick-fil-A here in Surfside. And I remember vividly standing back at that breading table, weeping into the batter. Hopefully OSHA doesn't hear this. And thinking to myself, I have missed God's will for my life. It felt like a step backwards in my life because I was ministering to teenagers for almost 20 years at that point. And God was using us and God was uh, blessing our ministry. And now I've got little zitty-faced teenagers telling me to take out the trash. And so God was using all of this as a brook in my life. Just like God is using perhaps this shutdown as a brook in your life. We all have been panicked. We've all scattered. We've all gotten scared. But yet God is using it to provide. He's using it to prepare. He's using it for a purpose to give him glory. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 1 in verse 6, Paul writes, he says, Being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm confident that God will finish what he started in the believer. Psalm 37, verse 23, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Sometimes we feel like those steps might be ordered by the Lord, but he's ordering us to go backwards. But in the grand scheme of things, when we look at our life through the lens of God's word, there's no such thing as a backwards step when the sovereign hand of God is moving us forward. Yes, sometimes that might mean we got to stay by the brook for three years or four years, or in my case, it was for 14 years. I was a hard learner. I was stubborn. But sometimes we have to learn those things. And the Bible says in verse 23 that he delighteth in his way. It got to the point where I threw out my ideas and my lofty plans and goals and was overjoyed with the fact that God had a plan and that I was not in control of it and that he was leading the way. So uh, Proverbs 16, 9 says, A man's heart deviseth his own way, but the Lord directs his steps. My, my goal, your goal sometimes in your life, we've got these, we've got these ideas, we've got these plans, these goals, and we, we plan these things out. We ought to be planners. But we ought to plan these things with the mindset of, God, you are in control. You do it however you please. If you want to throw this aside, we'll do it. And 99.9% .9 of the time, he does. And so we also see in Psalm 119, 133, he says, Order my steps in thy word, and let not any sin have dominion over me. When we start lining our life up by the scripture, by the absolute truth of God's word, he orders our steps through the word of God. That is the purpose of it. He says in verse 1 and 5 of that same chapter, the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That brook in your life that feels like a step back is actually a step forward because the God of preparation is preparing you for more. Yes, it will look like a humbling experience. There will be some honing in on our life, in our heart, and the crevices that we don't want anybody else to see. God sees those things. And yes, it will take some healing, but it is all to get God to make us more of a reflection of Christ. The Gospel of John says in chapter 15 and verse 1 and 2, it says, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it that it may bear yet more fruit. The word in verse 2, the two words takes away, in the Greek is A-I-R-O-S, eros. And it literally means to lift up. 
So if you imagine the vine dresser getting down on his knees and picking up those leaves that are on the ground that are starting to mildew, and the Bible says that that vine dresser lifts it up because it's not bearing fruit, so he lifts it up and he ties it to the, the, the vine and it gets it up, gets more sunlight and more of the nutrients come into it. And he says every branch that does bear fruit, he cuts it, he prunes it. I have azaleas in my uh, yard and every year uh, in, uh, in, in February, I have to cut those branches back and I always get nervous. Like, These things are never going to grow back. Uh, crepe myrtles as well. And, uh, and, and you, you cut them all the way back just under where they bloom. And every year, in, the, in a matter of six months, they, sh they shoot back up. And they make these beautiful, uh, these beautiful uh, arrangements. But there's a cutting process that's involved. And God's doing that very same thing in my life, in your life, in the life of every believer and the child of God that operates in His will. And so in 1 Kings chapter 18, we come here. Now, in 17 verse 2, the Bible said that he told Elijah, Elijah, I want you to go and I want you to hide yourself. But now we find in verse 1, it says, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year. And he says, Go show yourself unto Ahab, and I will send rain unto the earth. That was great news. But now... Elijah has to step in front of the enemy, the same king and queen that wants to destroy him, put him on the hit list of every person in, in the region. Look, they've looked over every rock. They've looked through all the caves that they possibly could find, and yet they could not find Elijah. Now God's telling you, I want you to go and show yourself. The Elijah that we see in chapter 18 and verse 1 is the, uh, not the same man that we have in in chapter 17, in verse 1, 2, and 3. What's the difference? Why is he a different man in a three-year span? The reason is he embraced the brook. He embraced that season in his life where he was behind closed doors, where he was not in the forefront, where he was behind the scenes, and God was working in him and pouring into him and giving him what he needed to prepare him for what was to come on Mount Carmel. So often we present these, these goals, these ideas, and we ask the Lord to bless them. And the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, in chapter 5, verse 6, he says, Humble yourselves, therefore, in the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. Sometimes when I read, read, read this verse at the very beginning of my uh, ministry, I would read, humble yourself, humble yourself. It almost seemed like an oxymoron to me. Because there was so much arrogance and so much pride in my life. And still in some areas, there probably still is. But Peter said, humble yourself before the Lord. Because if we don't humble ourselves, you can bet on it that he's going to do it for us. God has a place ready for you and me. He has a, an opportunity that he is preparing us for. But there are times where the place is ready for us but we are not ready for the place. So as we look in chapter 18, in the first, I guess, 15 verses this week, we find that Elijah, and I'll just kind of paint the picture here for you. Elijah says, I want you to prepare yourself because God is bringing the rain. And so he goes and he shows himself to Ahab, and Ahab calls him a troubler of Israel. He, he blames all of it on him. But the Bible says during the process of the famine that King Ahab and a very trusted advisor or a man by the name of Obadiah. Obadiah was a man of God. He feared the Lord. He walked with the Lord. Matter of fact, in verse 4 of chapter 18, the Bible says that the Queen Jezebel massacred hundreds of the prophets of God. And in that time span, Obadiah takes a hundred of those prophets and he hides 50 in one cave and 50 in another cave, and he makes sure they have bread and water, and he fed them. Now, Obadiah was a brave man, but he wasn't stupid. And so he was able to do all this under the nose of Ahab and under the nose of Queen Jezebel. And so Ahab and Obadiah uh, are looking for water for the cattle. And Ahab is so enamored with the cattle more than he would so be by the people that he's supposed to be serving. 
He's more concerned about the, the himself than he is others, the people that, of, of Israel that he's supposed to be serving. And so Elijah goes in one direction, or Ahab goes in one direction, and Obadiah goes in, the, in another direction. They're looking for water. They're looking for grass. And in the midst of Obadiah looking for it, he runs into, guess who? Elijah. And Elijah tells Obadiah, listen, Obadiah, I want you to go tell Ahab, I'm coming. I'm here. And Obadiah goes, hold up. D don't you realize I just, I just put my life on the line? I just risked it all to save a hundred of God's prophets? They have turned over every stone and looked of, in every cave they possibly can. And they've made everybody swear that they can't find you. Now you want me to step in front of the king and say, oh, I found him. He'll kill me. And, and, and Obadiah even said, what have I, how have I sinned that you put me to to a death sentence such as this. And Elijah says, As the Lord of hosts live, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. When we stand in the presence of an almighty God, it prepares us for so many things in our life. We'll see that next week in chapter 19 as we continue on in, the, in this particular passage of Scripture as we look in the life of Elijah. But church, I want to encourage you. We're going through what they call a global pandemic. We're, we're looking more for the stimulus check than we are for what truly stimulates the, the believer, and that's the Word of God. We need to get our eyes off of all of this junk that's going on around us, and then we need to get in our closets, and then we need to get on our knees and we need to probably repent and ask God to give us a vision for the gospel. And there's a lot of preachers that are saying that, you know, this is, a, this is a punishment on the United States and on the world to repent for those to come to Christ. But this is also an opportunity for children of God to repent, for falling asleep and becoming apathetic to the power of the gospel. We've made it something that it is not. And the gospel is simply that Jesus Christ died on a cross for your sins and mine, he was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And he is still alive and he is still on his throne. And he's interceding for you and me even this, at this moment. And he's preparing a place for us. But that while he's preparing that place, he's also preparing you and me. So I don't know what it is in your life this morning that that has uh, been used to, to burrow into your spirit this morning as you are probably standing next to a brook that you feel like is a step back. It might be a wilderness. It might be a place of confusion and uncertainty. But know this, if God sent you there, he's going to provide. He sent you there, he's going to have a purpose. He sent you there, there's going to be a sense of protection. That, that God has got this and he's got you in mind in every area. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, that all things work together for good to them that love God, for them that are called according to his purpose. That's 28, but verse 29, remember, it says, so that we may be conformed to the image of his son. When they see you, when the world sees you, do they see you or are they seeing Christ in you? Church, thank you so much for being with us this morning. God bless you. Amen. Hey, guys. So this song comes from Psalm 46, which basically says that um, God is our refuge and our shelter and our comforter in times of need. Um, and we as a nation are in need of God. Um, so help me sing this song. It's called Lord of Hosts. the spear and tells the waters to cease. Almighty one of Israel, you are on our side. We walk by faith in God who burns the chariots with fire. Lord of hosts, you're with us. With us sing the fire. With us as a shelter. With us in the storm. You will lead us through the fiercest battle. Oh, 
things I know my God is in control. Lord, a posture with us, with us in the fire, with us as a shelter, with us in the storm. You will lead us through the fierce. way the mountains move into the sea the nations rage i know my god is in control 